Greetings and welcome to another Warhammer 40,000 Kill Team video where today I'm going over for my guide about how to win and play with Void Dance Troop. But before we get into things, please remember to like and subscribe as well as comment. Let me know what you thought of this video. Did you find it useful or helpful or did I miss anything? Let me know. Remember, I've got Discord. You can check out in the episode description below for free. An affiliate link, Element Games, and a Patreon if you want to give me some more support. But yeah, let's get on with this guide. In this guide, I'll be talking how to play and win with Void Dancer Troop. So they are an eight operative semi-elite kill team of Eldari Harlequin. So they're one of the Eldari kill teams. Originally released in White Dwarf, but now you can find their rules in the Kill Team Annual 2022. They aren't a bespoke team. They are actually made from normal kits for Warhammer 40,000. And for a more in-depth review, check out my video review of the Kill Team. But remember, this is before they had all these balanced status late changes because of how well they're performed. And considering Season 3 isn't jungle and instead is oil rigs, this kill team is probably going to be the best kill team for Season 3. So I thought, why not do a guide on a team that will never change from now on? So Void Dancer Troop Strengths. Every operative is free APL would fly, a 4 plus in vulnerable save, and 8 to 9 wounds. So that means your team is 24 APL. Effectively, you've got flying marines, right? And... Eight to nine wounds is pretty good, pretty good. Like nine on your leader and your other key operatives, eight on everyone else. So it's actually really hard to kill you in one volley from like even three, four guns. Two, three guns will just tickle you. So really good stat profile. They have lots of rules that legally break the rules of the game because basically, as I've discussed in what makes a kill team strong, Void Dancer, a troop, have a lot of ways to legally break the rules of the game. Like, for example, fly. They literally ignore all terrain rules. They just fly through them. Like, oh, if someone's nine inches away, they are nine inches away unless they can't place them there. So very, very powerful. Say deaths. So say deaths are like their chapter tactics. You pick them at the start of the game based on each opponent, and then you can change them as long as your leader's alive. They give you lots of bonuses. And once you've got four say death points, you get a free command point and even extra rules. So it's just a win more. Really powerful. They have great melee and close range firepower. As always, like your blades are four attack, uh, five attacks, hitting on threes, four five with balanced, and then you have a plethora of specialized melee weapons you can take, which makes you even deadlier based on the opponent. And you know, they have really good close range firepower. They they do have pistols, but they're free forward rending, and they have other weapons as well. They have powerful ploys along with ways to get reliable surplus command points. So they literally have insane ploys like so powerful one of them has even been nerfed in a way and they also have lots of ways to get command points one of them was removed but remember once i said when they get four say death points they get a free command point just for being themselves and they've got equipment that either gives them free rerolls or a free command point on death so really actually quite efficient in getting command points they have great equipment literally they have a prismatic grenade which is a free four blast uh, blast white grenade amazing they have the support grip which makes a death jester like dumb and they have like the death mask so when someone dies they get a, you get a command point they've got the wraith bone talisman for a reroll as well as upgrades for all their melee weapons they have great general and faction tack ops because they have access to infiltration which everyone forgets recon and seek and destroy but they also have really good faction tack ops like basically mythic play and grand axe are really good and you're generally taking recon, but they have such a great selection of tack ops. Really, really valuable. And then also, everyone is on 25 mil bases. I know people kind of overlook this, but having a 25 mil base is really powerful in Kill Team. It's the smallest base size in the game. It's effectively an inch. It allows you to easily more dash off vantage points and block off movement. Because let, let's say you're playing someone on a 28 mil base or a 32 mil base, you can now make a 25 mil gap for your base to move for about like around a barricade where they can't. It's really really powerful, and those are they have so many strengths. Such a powerful kill team. For the weaknesses, they are only eight operatives. It's effectively a semi elite. The only other kill team with eight operatives uh, are Hierotech Circle, but it's generally after elites the smallest size. They are capped at 8 to 9 wounds, and while 8 to 9 wounds is really nice, it's still not as great as being 12 wounds. You're like in this weird middle ground of just being a little bit better than elites, but like even a crit bolter will, will knock you down to 4 wounds. 
So you have to be careful. There are no ways to get APL modifiers, which is balanced by the way that you rule free APL. You do have one way to potentially reduce minus one APL from other operatives, enemy operatives, but you have no way to buff yourself. So if you're in like a mirror situation or you have no way to break a tie and your opponent does, you're going to lose out there. They only have a four plus invon, so can go down to enough shooting, right? They have ways to mitigate this, but a four plus plus only goes so far, especially when you're getting hit by five dice attacks. So you do have to be careful, right? You can find the roster limiting due to so many melee equipment options because you will want to change your melee equipment based on who you're facing. And there are situations where you will cap out just because you don't have enough spaces. You're limited to one Neurodisruptor and Fusion Pistol, whereas before in the Compendium you could take three or up to three of a combined. So you could go three Fusion Pistols, three Neurodisruptors or a mix of three between them both. And the other issue is your lead player and your Shadow Seer can both take either a Neuro Disruptor or Fusion Pistol and Neuro Disruptor when it comes to your leader. But that still takes up your slot and it kind of makes them too valuable. So it's a bit of a downgrade there. Faction rules can be confusing and complex to use. This kill team is kind of really not beginner friendly, but also beginner friendly because everyone has fly. And the more in-depth you look into the rules, you can miss quite a lot if you're just glancing at first. And it can be very confusing to play and keep track of everything, especially when it comes to save death points and who's your lead player. Well, your pivotal role. It also is a very expensive kill team to buy. As I'll get onto when collecting, this isn't made from a single box. You will need at least three boxes to build this kill team, which makes it very expensive. So your key operatives. First, you have your lead player. This is your leader, right? The key thing is they can take a power weapon, which you always take. And then they have a shuriken pistol or one of your other special pistols. Personally, I always take the power weapon and shuriken pistol, but I have opened up more to taking the fusion pistol on the leader against elites. This does mean your opponent basically gets a guaranteed, a very guaranteed chance, right, to get headhunter from you. But when you've got a fusion pistol hitting on twos, it's very tempting. I know a lot of people fan of the giving the neuro disruptor to the leader, so it hits on twos. But personally. I just prefer Shuriken Pistol or Fusion Pistol. Gunners, you're always taking a Fusion Pistol and a Neuro Disruptor. These are your key, like, melee, like, gun pieces. So a lot of the times you'll just have these operatives move dash and pistol. But because you're free APL, they can charge, kill, and then pistol someone. So they have a lot of threat range. Your Death Jester, he has a Shuriken Cannon, which is five attacks hitting on freeze, four, five, with heavy and humbling cruelty and fusillade and rending. So anyone who loses wounds for from that shooting attack counts as being injured for the turning point. And he has a Shrieker Harvest over two action points, he gains Torrent and he can, on his gun, which is Torrent White, which is really powerful. Now, normally it wouldn't be that great, but he has a support grip for one equipment point, which is kind of dumb and then basically gives him as long as he doesn't move more than red during his movement he doesn't have heavy so it just kind of makes him very crazy and that's why he's so powerful he's nine wounds and it's like once he become like if you're playing the sadef that lets you reroll and shooting he becomes very powerful then you've got your shadow here who was a psyker who can cast two psychic powers and has a selection of three you've got veil of tears which can give you some nice cover Fog of Dreams, which is great for delaying, and the Mirror of Minds, which is great for mortal wounds damaging. But also it has has like a prismatic stun grenade, so it can stun people. Really powerful operative. And then your key, other key operatives are literally not just your general players, but the players you give specific melee weapons. So there will become times in matchups where you take normal warriors with different melee weapons just for, to, for teching purposes. So it's really important to keep a track on your roster who you want to tech into. So it's very important to plan ahead. So how to collect this kill team? To collect the Void Dancer troop, you will need one box of Harlequin troops, a Death Jester, and a Shadow Seer. It's uh, quite expensive, I'm afraid. The two, the two characters are just as or slightly more expensive than your box of Harlequin troops because a box of Harlequins six. The main downside with this is while you can invest in magnets, you only get two of each melee weapon. So unfortunately, you will need a second box of Harlequin troops if you want mostly everything. I bought three boxes, right? I have bought three boxes of Harlequin troops along with the Death Jester and Shadows here. But I don't like magnetizing. I find the models very finickety. And it just gave me all the options so I could... Because some of my loadouts are I give everyone kisses. Or I give everyone embraces or caresses. So... 
it's something to be aware of because even in the normal box you can only get two of each other special weapon for the melee so yeah so for the void dancer troop tactics one of the main tactics is moving up the board with ranged options on engage, but safe with domino field. So domino field is, well, as long as you're more than red from enemy operatives and you're within black of a terrain piece, you count as having concealed no matter what, even if you're an engage. So it's slightly worse than the compendium one, whereas as long as you were just more than white from enemy operatives. But it does allow you to ha effectively have super conceal. And the main trick here is you move up your ranged operatives on engage, Within black of heavy cover, well, within black of any cover, including barricades. But if your opponent gets near, you can then overwatch. It's more powerful than Death Jester because your Death Jester can just sit on a vantage point, on engage, and then just wait. Which and then you go like, oh, I'll either wait for like your last gunner, so your gunner doesn't have a target, or I'm just gonna wait and get shot off and then like ignore your return fire. So it can be very powerful. You do have to remember now it costs CP 1 plus. So turning point 1, if you use it, 1 CP, turning point 2 is 2 CP. So you have to remember that. Using fly to make many of the board areas dangerous from turning point 1 and onwards. Especially when you combine this with the recon dash, you can dash 3 inches as your recon, then move and dash 9 inches and throw your grenade to 6 inches, right? So that gives you an effective threat range of 18 inches, which is huge, especially against horde teams, right? You just go like, eat my prismatic grenade. You make them like your uh, pivotal roll for shooting and every shot will have balanced. Insane, very powerful. But even that, you can use it with your gunners. So like your fusion pistol, it's only blue range, but you can literally dash blue and then go like, cool, I've got a nine inch minimum threat range melter pistol. What are you gonna do about it? So you can apply a lot of threat with this kill team. You're usually going melodrama with the lead player, well, the pivotal role being the death jester or a gunner. So the power for melodrama is every time you incapacitate an enemy operative in shooting with a shooting attack that has two or more dice that will successfully resolve. So let's say I roll four hits, my opponent rolls two saves, but they die. I still get a point for melodrama. And then once I've got my accolade, everyone gets that special rule which is everyone gets balanced for their shooting attacks and if you have your lead player well your pivotal role they get that from the beginning so usually you start a melodrama and then what you can do turning point like two or three you can switch up but i'll get onto that later mirror of minds is great for chipping because you need to pick someone in your line of sight from your psyker unlimited range you roll six dice they roll six dice for every dice that matches they take a mortal wound so up to six mortal wounds of damage really good at chipping elites and then you use fog of dreams because you just pick anyone visible and you roll a d6 and that's how many activations they're delayed by really powerful especially if your opponent has chaff they want to run up first because most people i see misplay and go i'm going to pick your gunner it's like my gunner was already going to activate last. It's like picking a melee operative or someone who needs to go first. Like, even if your opponent only has one operative in range, you can alpha strike and you have first activation. And you just go, I'll fuck dreams you. Because you're minimally delaying them by an activation, so you have time to react. But if you delay them by six, you can just go, you guys out in the open, I've got like six activations. I can just do whatever I want. Then you've got switching sadifs via your leader, turning point two or three onwards, making for easy maxing of your attack ops and sadif points and maximum punishing. So remember, each operative can only score a sadif point once. So even if you switch sadif points, they don't get to rescore that tally. So you have to be smart. But what you can do is start on melodrama, right? So you start shooting people, and then like a lot of like what I used to do a lot was switch to epic because depending on the opponent, Epic lets you automatically retain a crit, well, automatically strike with a crit if you didn't roll any crits, especially with kisses, that's really powerful. So like, you shoot against some guardsmen, get three Sadef points, switch your Sadef from, from Melodrama to Epic, charge someone, kill them uh, in two or less hits with your attack dice, immediately score epic and now everyone who charges someone just instantly murders someone, very powerful. Or you can even switch to comedy. I like playing comedy not comedy, sorry, switching to tragedy. I like playing tragedy against shooting teams, but I like racking up the points first, then switching to tragedy, because what tragedy does when active, so it you get a point every time an operative has lost a wound, right? So it's actually quite easy in a in sort of a chip damage way, right? Because, you know, you, you're eventually going to do it. But while everyone, while tragedy is active, you get to retain a dice even if you're not in cover. So it makes you really hard to kill Verse shooting teams. Then you've got the fusion pistol with the wraithbone talisman and or death mask. 
Personally, I like giving him the death mask because literally my fusion pistol lasts a turn. Like the moment it shoots is usually dead. So I like that nice return as I alpha your one of your operatives. And then the moment you kill my, my fusion pistol, I get another command point back, which gives me more tools to work with. Then you've got your prismatic grenade player. As I've already stated, you can just rush up the board. You really, even against eight wound operatives, because you're free four, really threatening. So it, it allows you to really punish into hordes. And then for faction tack ops, I like to take grand act versus elite, where you need to, where you need to score each allegory once. And I think that's really easy to do versus elites. Whereas I take mythic play, which is ga gain four tally points for one victory point or six for two. Like basically, as I said, grand act versus elites, mythic play versus everyone else. So if they've got eight or less operatives, I'd go grand act. If they've got anything more, I'd go with mythic play. Very, very good. Once again, you'd play recon most of the time. Seek and destroy versus hordes, but infiltration is still pretty good. The only thing is they don't have enough bodies to really use infiltration to its best, but recon is so powerful with this kill team. And then for melee weapons, generally you take kisses versus seven wound operatives. Because remember, uh, Harlequin's kiss is 3-7. So the moment you roll a crit, especially if you're five attacked, which is about a 51.3% chance to roll a crit, or if you're running epic, everyone's rolling a crit. So you just instantly kill seven wound operatives, which is really good when you're trying to minimize damage being returned in combat. I like to take caresses versus Nurgle legionary because they have rending, right? So if you roll four hits with one of them being a crit, that's two crits and two hits. So unless the Nurgle legionary tries to parry you out, you are going to kill them in three hits. And then I also like upgraded embraces, usually taking one or two depending on the opponent because it's lethal five up. It does get like uh, reap one but i'm generally taking it having brutal is really nice but it's because it's lethal five up so it becomes four five lethal five up to get around those those teams that really mess up either relying on normal hits to get around damage or are really vulnerable to crits now for hard bad matchups instead of talking about the good matchups i prefer talking about what's hard because usually Everything else that is not on the list is a good matchup, even all good, right? So you, you don't need to worry too much about those. So veteran guardsmen are just hard because they have a lot of bodies. And even though I've, I've, I've got like a decent win rate into vet guard, it can be very hard as horde teams are actually kind of this team's weakness. Pathfinders, they'll just shoot you. Like as the Pathfinder player, I love playing into Void Dancer Troop. Just mark a light. You take uh, three railguns because you take marksmen and two railguns just delete the harlequins they just can't deal with all that four or five damage it's too much commandos are hard as well even though you're relying on segarach's jest which is by the way the most, one of the most broken strats in the game the issue is each commander has 10 wounds and kills you in two hits and they are even if you parry them out right they have the body to just push through so you really have to watch out for commandos novitiates are quite hard as well and it's not too hard for me because what I did in the Novitiates matchup is I don't take the Death Jester. I just take everyone with kisses. Don't take the Death Jester because he's not going to get a shot and just rush forwards. And then I just aim for Epic as soon as possible because the moment I get into Epic, it's just literally charge sister dead, shriek and pistol. Charge just pistol, like just charge kill. So good. But they are actually a really hard team to play against. Imperial Navy breaches are really hard because they're all eight wounds with brace. So as long as they haven't moved or charged, your weapons are going down from 4-5 to 3-4. So it's really a struggle in Imperial Navy breaches. They don't care about your blast because of their void armor. It's actually kind of not impossible, but it's really, really hard. And they also have 12 operatives and can theoretically have anywhere from 11 to 12 activations, which will, they'll just play rings around you. So you have to be really careful. Legionary can be quite hard as well. Just because of how they can switch up between the marks, they have better melee operatives. And if you fluff against them, especially if they're running Nurgle, they will just punch you to death. So you have to be very careful into Legionary. Chaos Cult are a problem as well. More so on Into the Dark. But the thing about Chaos Cult, if they space out, go in like, cool, you're going to get some shots off, but you're, you're never going to get blast shots off. Torments will rip through Harlequins. And because they've got 40 mil bases, they can be quite likely to double charge them. So you have to watch out for that because Torments will just rip through Harlequins. And then finally, you have Inquisitorial Agent kill team. It's still really powerful. Remember, they can stop Domino Field once and they can also so stop Segrax Suggest. So turning point one, they turn off Domino Field. 
So you have to play on and conceal. And then turning point two, they turn off Segarach's Jest. And if you aren't aware, Segarach's Jest is when your opponent strikes you with a hit that isn't a crit, you, the controlling player, the Harlequin player, not, not the opponent, rolls a d6. If it's equal to or below their weapon skill value, that dice turns into a parry and they can parry any of your hits. But it's like, if you think about it, it turns someone who has some freeze on a 50% chance to parry and they can just turn that off. So Inquisitor Agents also being like 11 to 12 activations can just out-activate you again and they have lots more tricks than you do. So it can be really tough. So this is a new thing for my guide. It's called Key Matchup Tricks because I've played a lot of Void Dancer Troop. I've won several tournaments with them. So I've took them to America once. These are some tricks I've learned, right? So lead player with Fusion Pistol as pivot to roll versus elites because you're going to activate him last versus elites turning point one. So you can move and dash, Fusion Pistol someone, you, you give him whatever equipment. I like making him the pivotal role for Melodrama so he has balanced because he's hitting on twos anyway. And then if you win initiative, he moves or he charges, kills another elite player and then shoots another Marine. So he can potentially kill three Marines before going down. As the downside, you do give away Headhunter most likely, but killing three Marines, two to three Marines for Headhunter, I think that's a good trade. Then you take two to three upgraded kisses versus intercession. Depends how much equipment points you want to put in. Like I like putting the death mask on my fusion pistol or giving the wraithbone talisman if he's not my lead player. Well, pivot to roll. But I think two to three upgraded kisses versus intercession makes that match up. No problem. Because the problem we had before as a Harlequin player, the intercession used to be really tough because of their 14 wounds and durable. And then you realized, oh yeah, if I just upgrade the kiss, it goes from three seven to four seven. So if you strike, charge in, and you do like the murderous entrance, so you strike with a crit and a hit, instead of doing 11 damage, you do 10 damage, and then you'll kill them on the next hit for four. Very powerful, and suddenly made that match up just a joke, because you didn't care. As long as you got one crit and like three other hits, you would do 14 damage. Very powerful, and it made that match up quite a joke. You can even take these against commandos, but... I just like how it works against intercession. Then you get caresses versus Nurgle Legionnaires have already covered because of how their Nurgle ploy works. So it makes them minus one damage to a normal attack to a minimum of three. So your blades go to three five. But if you take a caress, you have rending. So if you, as I said, if you roll two crits and two, if you roll a crit and three hits, that goes to two crits and a hit. So you can do 13 damage, which will kill effectively everyone in that kill team. So very, very good. And then against Wormblade. So this is a very matchup specific thing I've learned as well. You take one Caress and one Upgraded em Embrace versus Wormblade. Because the problem I had with the Wormblade is the Locust, right? Because the Locust has five attacks, hit on twos, lethal five up, and he gets the parry first. So if you charge him and you only were wrong one crit, he parries that out and then he murders you. Because he has nine wounds to your eight. You effectively trade one operative. Well, you'll need two Harlequins to kill him. But if you take a caress or an upgraded embrace, if you take a caress, you're likely to get a crit, which will proc into two crits because of rending. And as long as you've got three hits, that is a dead locus, because even if they parry that crit, you do murderous entrance and do nine damage, he's dead. And against with the embrace, you're more likely with the lethal five up to roll multiple crits to nullify his parrying of your crit. And the reason I take one of each is because I put on one on each flank to counter wherever the locust goes so i can go the locust is going to be somewhere and wherever spot he is it's going to die and then i said the other key matchup tricks against an officiate is i don't take the death jester it's the only matchup i don't take the death jester i just go another player and i go all kisses so play styles you've got aggressive rushdown very common play style you move up to secure four objectives because you're all free apl you fly and you threaten with your gunners death jester and prismatic grenade as I said, you have a normal player either on infiltrate or just running up with an engage order to prismatic airstrike someone. And then you've got your death jester who can just wait on engage on a vantage point behind cover. Just going, I'm going to shoot. You're going to move anyone into the open. I've got domino, domino field. And it's just you secure four objectives and then you set this tempo where you can just suddenly push into the opponent and try to keep them on two primary each turn. Then you've got assassination, which is basically you're moving up but dedicating to kill key operatives each turning point with the use of ploys, etc. So you like use murder entrance to charge in and kill one operative. You know, you have your fusion pistol who can move and dash and melt someone in the face. It's a more drawn out form of play, 
But if you just play quite reserved and just go, okay, I'm sending this out operative out to Kaliber 2 or this key operative of yours, and then it's going to take the rest of your kill team to try and kill them. And if you try and kill them, it allows me to punish. It forces your opponent into really bad moves and maximizes your low output of players. And it actually makes it really powerful when you start like against Wormblade. You assassinate their key operatives or into, into elites. You just like kill their leader and go like, cool, that's him done. What are you going to do? Oh, move up. Okay, I'm going to move up and kill the metal pistol. And then if you don't kill that guy, I'll do it again next turning point. Then you've got Cautious Control, which is moving up cautiously with Domino Field with the Death Jester providing cover and fire if needed. So this is just, you're playing more to secure the objectives and stand back, maybe more with recon or infiltration. And then you just have the Death Jester going like, look, I'm safe here. If you come forward, I will punish. And it's just like, it's more, it's a mix of assassination and aggressive rushdown, but you're just aiming to be more cautious. And it's something you actually do more into hordes and certain elites. Like, I'm actually terrified of Corn Legionary as uh, Harlequins, just because it makes a lot of their operatives just strike you with a crit immediately for eight damage. So you have to be very careful. So in that kind of situation, you can't just riskily move through to, forward a turning point because the next turning point you can be charged and instantly killed. So you have to be careful. So for the Void Dancer Troop Guide overview, hopefully this will help you actually know how to play and win. So it's a very complex kill team, but it's also very easy to play because everyone has fly. Right? Everyone has fly. And it can be actually quite hard to switch from this team going back to playing other teams because everyone is free APR, everyone has fly, so you ignore all the terrain rules. It's really easy for you to capture objectives and do tack ops and like other things. So you have to be very careful, but they're still quite hard to play. You have to get around the save death points. Like I made, I got acrylic tokens printed for me that let me nominate who is my pivotal role each each time my sadef is active then i have like tokens i use to track my sadef so i can go like oh i'll put this token next to this operative to show they've scored my sadef point so now they can't score any sadef points you have to keep track of when your leader is can switch because you need a leader alive to switch your sadefs you need to study your opponents to go which sadef to pick as I said, most of the time you're picking Melodrama for the shooting buff, and then you're either switching to Epic or switching to Tragedy. So Epic is for the crits if you're, if you're running mass kisses and you're focusing on crits, or Tragedy if like you're facing shooting hordes and you just want to ignore all their shooting. Because remember, with Plasmatic Blur, you have a four-up in Von, with Tragedy active as its allegory, you get to retain a save even in the open, then you've got two dice on four-ups with a reroll, and then you can pay for another reroll. So it can make you just bounce off of shooting and force people to charge you. And when you've got Segratch's Jesters up, you can just parry them out and kill them. It's crazy, crazy good. They also have a lot of Alpha Strike potential, mainly investing in the Recon Dash, but it's because they have fly. So, you know, as I said, you've got the airstrike prismatic grenade. It does have stun. Stun is very powerful. So even if you don't kill people, you're stunning them. Really, really strong. And even on Into the Dark, you can fly through. People forget you can just fly over open doors. People are blocking doors, but it's open. You just fly through them. And even if you open them mid-move, as long as they're not guarded behind it, you can just fly on through. Really powerful kill team. They have great tack op selections. The only one they can't take is security, but they don't need it. And they have really, really good faction tack ops. Like you only need four say death points to get a command point and get a victory point, right? If you're taking uh, the tally one and you only need six say death points. And remember when your pivotal roll scores, your scores at say death, it gets two points for your t tally. So it's really easy to max this. And against elites, you just take the grand act because it against elites, you can stage out more doing each of your Sadef acts. And then other than that, it's just learning the matchups. You are going to struggle with the roster. But as I said, it's you're only struggling because you don't have enough. You don't have enough slots. If you had 30 slots, you'd be able to tech for everything. As I said, kisses against seven wound operatives. Then you take blades against everything else. I like the rending once again like nurgle legionary and there's still room for the brutal ones because you can give them lethal five up but they're also brutal which is becoming more powerful as we're getting more melee teams and they're also just very flexible so you do have to threaten them there's there's they have a lot of more bad matchups at the moment mainly like imperial navy breaches and commandos which are quite rough and then depending on how like you can't 
underestimate legionary like nurgle legionary is really tough for this kill team especially if they can't get off shots because if they're all on conceal and they've got like the grizzly trophy your fusion pistol only goes down goes down by one dice to two uh three attacks so you have to be very careful with how you play this kill team but if you play them right and also with a little bit of luck but they have a lot of rerolls you can just murder people and dominate the primaries while shutting down tac ops or just alphaing key opponent operatives they are expensive and i've seen people magnetize them but as i said if you want to go all the way, I bought three boxes of troopers and then, you know, you've got to buy the Death Jester and Shadow Seer. They're also quite annoying to paint, but I went with a quite more simpler paint scheme, which I'll probably pop up now, which is just like it's actually based off the Royal Flush Gang from Batman Beyond, but it's just quartered color schemes where you can paint them however you like. But if you wanted to, if you don't paint diamonds, people will point out no diamonds. I'm disappointed. But yeah, that's pretty much it from me today. Please remember to like and subscribe as well as comment. Let me know what you thought of this guy. Did you find it useful or helpful? Let me know if you thought I missed anything or if it's helped you play, you know, if you've actually used it already. And remember, I've got a Discord you can check out in the episode description below, an affiliate link at Element Games, and a Patreon if you want to give me some more support. So I'll quickly shout out my patrons. So for my adepts of the crit, I have Tom, Sam, NP, Nick, Mr. Meatwad, Kenzie, John Thomas, Dad of Goldens, Ben, and for my veterans of the crit, I have Samja. So thank you so much for all your support. It really means a lot to me and helps support the channel. So yeah, let me know what you thought of this guide. It's basically back to my old guides. So I've done one for Intercession. I've done one for Legionary, and now I've done one for Void Dancer Troop, partly because, well, they're likely never going to get changed, and Season 3 is just probably going to be really good for these guys. And yeah, this is like, even though I've played Legionary and Intercession, I've played a lot of Void Dancer Troop. I think I've won four tournaments with them. They are just kind of a crazy kill team. Even after the nerfs, you can just fly around stuff, and if people aren't prepared, like I've never lost to Elites, with Void Dancer Troop, they're just so good at killing Marines. It's amazing. A lot of Void Dancer Troop players disagree with me, but literally, the moment we figured out, oh yeah, if you just take Upgraded Kisses versus Intercession, that matchup is fine. It was just like, oh wow, yeah, they just die. There's nothing they can do around that. It's great. So, they are a really fun Eldari kill team to play, but not fun to play against. Just, just be aware of that. But until next time, no matter how terrifying your clowns in space are, Remember, there's always a chance to win, as long as you roll a crit.